Welcome back to Mechanical Pro. Scott Quentin with me here today. We're gonna to be uh, talking about how to use a service checker as a diagnostic tool for BRV, where to look for um, refrigerant flow issues. Quentin, so tell me what is the Daikin service checker tool and how would we use that and how would we apply it as a diagnostic tool? The Daikin service checker is a piece of hardware uh, that is used in accordance with a piece of software that allows us to get a, an inside look at the operational data of the system. Um, we can see outdoor unit data points such as temperatures, pressures, we can see indoor temperatures and things such as that. And so with this data, we're able to make diagnostics and confirmations and things such as that. System health checks, um, it's a very uh, valuable tool if you're going to be working on the VRV system. So with that being said, um, one of the most common questions that we get asked is, how do I determine if the system is low on refrigerant charge? Um, refrigerant charge uh, shortage is a a common theme because, uh, you know, whether it be flare nuts leaking or pipes cracking or whatever it might be, it's very important to be able to know if the system's low on charge. Or just low, not, not enough charge put in it. Not enough charge put in it from the yeah. startup, yeah. It yeah. could lead you to, to identify, hey, maybe, maybe the piping links weren't accurate. Maybe I need to remeasure the pipe, you know, and, and see if there's an issue there. The first thing that you will want to look at is what mode is the unit operating in? And so if you come up here on the service checker tree. So this is the service checker. This is service checker, yeah. So this is the, the data operation displayed um, on the screen. So this is actually data that we have previously recorded from a job site. Okay. But if you were looking at the data live, this is exactly how it would look, okay? So fortunately, this system presented a UO error code, which indicates that it had a shortage of charge. Okay. So it kind of gave us a hint, but that's not always gonna be the case. Um, sometimes you might have a system that's running low on charge and nobody knows it. Maybe the system is able to maintain set point, but the system isn't necessarily operating safely or, or, or as efficiently as it should be. So a system that's running uh, low on charge can result in uh, damaged compressors, shortened compressor life, um, things such as that. So uh, the first thing that you will want to look at is what mode is the unit operating in? I like to get a baseline for each one of the modes. You have three modes. You have cooling, which means that all of the indoor units are in cooling. You have heating, which means that all of the indoor units are in the heating mode. And then you have parallel mode, which means that you have a mix of some being in cooling, some being in heating. So on this snippet of data here, um, the unit is currently in the cooling mode. We know that because it says on. Notice that these other two options say off, okay? The next thing that you'll want to look at is the target evaporator temp. So this is the, uh, essentially the, the target evaporator temperature that the, the system is trying to achieve. So this is a, a pressure value that's been correlated to a temperature, just like looking at your manifold gauge set where it has the, the pink range underneath your, your pressures on 410A. This is exactly what that is, okay? okay? The next thing that you'll want to take into consideration is the discharge inverter temp. And we'll get to why that's important in a minute. You can also check the discharge standard temp but both of these generally are gonna be pretty close to the same, assuming that you don't have an oil return issue, which we will also discuss later. Another pertinent piece of information will be the outdoor heat exchanger liquid temp and the suction pipe temp. And then finally, we have the condensing temp and the evaporator temps. So you have a ton of data here. It's all important, but some of it is more important. Some of the pieces are more important than the others when trying to make a confirmation of adequate charge or lack of charge. So one thing that you'll notice is these are basically the same types of points that you would look at if you were judging superheat or subcooling on a conventional system. The one piece that stands out that might be a little bit different to you is the discharge temp. So that's gonna be a, a pipe temperature sensor that is located on the compressor, okay? And so it's helpful if you can pull up your piping diagram so one of the things that might stand out that you're not accustomed to uh, looking at maybe on your conventional system is the discharge temperature of the compressor. Now this is a very pertinent piece of information on the Daikin VRV system as we can calculate what's called discharge superheat based off of this value, okay? And so the first thing that I look at anytime um, that I'm gonna look at a VRV system and the, the health of the system is the discharge superheat because it generally tells you the story. Okay, so the range for a VRV3 for the discharge superheat will be 27 to 82 degrees, and on a VRV4 will be 27 to 72 degrees. Now you're wondering, how do we get to this temperature? Okay, so you take your discharge inverter temp, 
and subtract the condensing temp. Okay, and then that's gonna give you your discharge superheat. And so if I punch this in on my calculator, 199 minus 113, that gives us a value of 86 degrees. So we just mentioned that the, uh, the range is uh, 27 to 82 on a VRV3. So this is a VRV3 system. And so right off the bat, we see that that value is higher than the allowable range. This can be caused from a couple of different things. Uh, one of them, the most common, is shortage of refrigerant charge. The second will be shortage of oil. Now, we're already looking at a system that we assume is low on charge, so the next step would be to see what our suction superheat looks like. So the suction superheat is calculated in the exact same manner that you would calculate suction superheat on a conventional split system. And so you'll take your suction pipe temperature and you'll subtract your evaporator temperature. So let's break out the handy dandy calculator again. We've got 68 degrees, which you see here and then you subtract 32. So 68 minus 32 gives us 36 degrees. So the range for our suction superheat is supposed to be five and a half degrees to 14 and a half degrees. And so right off the rip, we see now that the compressors appear to be starved of a cooling effect from the refrigerant. And so now we're, we're already starting to come to a conclusion, okay, this system is low. But there's one more item that's worthy of checking, and that's gonna be the outdoor heat exchanger liquid temp and your condensing temp. Okay, so that's how we measure subcooling. Once again, this is the basic method of measuring subcooling for any conventional system. So we take our condensing temp and we subtract our liquid pipe temp. And so in this instance, that's gonna give us four degrees. So the range for that for VRV is supposed to be between eight and 14 degrees. So once again, we don't have a, a, enough subcooling. So once again, that's another indication of shortage of refrigerant charge. One more thing that you may or may not see will be the, that if the system is actually recognizing that it's low on charge, you'll be able to scroll down to the safety controls and you might see that the system is going into LP step down control, which is low pressure stepping down. Nine times out of 10, you're not gonna see that unless the system is extremely low. Uh, one more piece of information that might be helpful will be your fan speed for your um, outdoor fans. So the fan step, for a VRV3, uh, VRV3 system is gonna be anywhere from one to nine. So nine being the highest, nine being the fastest, okay? And so with this compressor ramped up to 94 revolutions per second, this compressor probably turns at full speed, it might turn 150 revolutions per second. So it's at the upper end of, uh, of the speed. And you notice that the fans are turning really slowly, okay? So this is at the bottom of the range uh, for fan speed. So this is in order to help keep our saturated evaporator temp in accordance with our target evap temp. Okay, so you notice that these two are almost spot on, right? So basically, the system is controlling ultimately to target evaporator temperature, and it tries to do that by any means necessary. Now there are some safeties that may come into play. You might see the subcooling heat exchanger open up, which is essentially in place to uh, help cool down the compressor. And then you can also look at the expansion valve position of that subcooling heat exchanger here. Right now it's not open very far. This is a 480 pulse scale. And then our uh, main heat exchanger EEV is also a 480 pulse valve and it's wide open. Okay, so from this, we have deduced that the system is low on refrigerant charge. And so now we can talk about, okay, what do we need to do to fix this? Can we top it off? Can we leave it? Okay, in an emergency situation you may have to top the system off to get, you know, it may be a hotel or a school or something like that where they need cooling now. You can top the system off, um, but you need to go ahead and have your plan in mind, discuss with your customer about how we're gonna actually fix this permanently because the refrigerant is gonna leak back out, then you're gonna have defective compressors. Okay, so. What do you mean by leak back out? Oh, from a leak? Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, so if the system's low on charge. You're gonna lose, yeah, you're it's going to keep leaking. Exactly. Especially if this is a system that you've looked at before and it would appear fine. You know, maybe let's say that you're, you're on site now and let's say that it's a cooler day maybe. And now all of a sudden the, the system is keeping up. Let's say that you get a call from your customer and they say, hey, this thing wasn't keeping up over the weekend. And you go out and all the rooms are satisfied. And so you need a means to, to ramp the system up. So what you can do is go to your outdoor unit and put the system into forced on mode and it will drive all of the indoor units on, and then you'll be able to get a load on the system and, and get this, these benchmark numbers. Quentin, quick question. If you are low on, does it ever, does the service tracker, service checker track oil separate from refrigerant? That's a great question. And the answer to that is simply no, not really. 
Um, on the VRV4 systems and later, you'll have a, a compressor body temp, which a lot of times will kind of help tell the story a little bit more. But the symptom of like a low oil condition, like a shortage of oil in the sump of the compressor, is your suction superheat will be pretty much spot on and your uh, discharge superheat will be way out of range. And so, you know, if you have adequate suction superheat coming back, you're cooling the compressor with enough cool refrigerant to keep the winding temperature down under normal circumstances, assuming that you had enough oil. But if you don't have enough oil in the sump of the compressor, you have that added friction. The added friction obviously creates heat, and that's where your discharge superheat becomes elevated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's why oil and refrigerant are so, com they're, they're so tied together. Oh, absolutely. If you have a refrigerant yeah. leak or low on charge, you're gonna have an oil problem, which is why you're gonna have a compressor failure eventually. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, we, we've talked about the upper range, you know, the refrigerant shortage, but let's say that you go out on a job and the discharge superheat is below that 27 degree threshold, okay? And then keep in mind, whenever you're taking these readings, the system needs to be stable and it needs to have been running for a little while, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes at least to stable operation uh, before you go benchmarking these numbers and getting excited. If you have a number that's below that discharge superheat range of 27 degrees, then you need to start looking for a floodback condition, you know? And so how does oil get washed out in the first place? Generally, you know, liquid refrigerant flooding back to the compressor. And so um, at that point, you need to start looking at your indoor unit expansion valves um, go through and shut each one of them off and see if any of them um, bleed by. Look at your outdoor heat exchanger position. Notice this one is, is at 480 and, and the four-way valve positions have the um, outdoor heat exchanger in a position to be a condenser. But oftentimes in those shoulder seasons or in the winter time, your outdoor unit is acting as an evaporator. So the heat exchanger in the outdoor will be an evaporator and it might want to pinch this valve off to zero pulses, you know, because it's going to basically control uh, like an indoor unit, it's going to have you know, superheat control across that heat exchanger. And so if that valve closes all the way off and you've still got refrigerant flowing through it, that refrigerant's uncontrolled. Okay, and so you're going to be flooding the compressor out. One more thing that uh, I just remembered in talking about evaporators. Take a look at your indoor units whenever you're looking for a low charge condition. All of these EEVs are at the 2000 pulse range. Now 2000 pulses is at, at the top of the range. That, that means it's wide open, mm -hmm. completely open. So under normal operating conditions, the liquid and the gas pipe temperature should have about a nine degree difference between the two. A lot of people get stumped up on the liquid pipe temperature because that's not really a liquid pipe temperature in the, in the conventional sense of the word. The liquid pipe temperature is actually a value taken after the expansion valve. Um, so basically this is like a flash gas or a slurry mixture, okay? So under normal conditions, this will be a nine degree difference between these two. And you should never see this indoor expansion valve above a thousand pulses under normal operating conditions. Mm -hmm. And so once again, this is another uh, point of, okay, this, this charge is, is definitely low on this system. Do you remember how low this charge was? We actually haven't got approval to go recover the charge on this one yet. Okay. But this is one that we've got a quote out to do a, a refrigerant recovery on it and uh, pressure test the system with nitrogen to find out where the leaks are. If you do find a leak, the best practice is always to recover all the gas. Absolutely. Know, know exactly what you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, pull into a vacuum and then Recharge it with the calculated amount of refrigerant. That's uh, the best. Can you way put to do the it. same refrigerant back in, or do you do you go with a fresh charge? We never do, especially on um, sites where you know it's a new customer. You have no idea what's been done to that system. You have no idea um, how the vacuum was pulled. You don't know if the proper procedures were followed. Refrigerant's getting more expensive, but it's always the safest bet to just go ahead and change that refrigerant. You yeah. know that the system's clean. Know that it's tight. Know that it's dry. It's still not more expensive than labor and expertise. No, it you're absolutely right. It's, I promise that. you it'll be cheaper than one compressor replacement. Yeah, absolutely. One compressor replacement will blow that out of the water. Uh, Quinn, you know, I got my service checker certification 10 years ago, but if you asked me to do this, I wouldn't even know how to plug it back in and, and fire it back up. Sure. So, you know, how do you, what, what's your number one tip of learning how to use the service checker tool as, as an efficient tool? Doing it every day. Yeah. Digging yeah. into it. Digging into it and taking your time. You know, this is, there's nothing fast about VRV service. You know, this is, there's a lot of temperature values. There's a lot of different vintages of equipment. Um, I mean, anytime that I go on a system, no matter what the vintage is, even like VRV3, a system that I'm intimately familiar with, 
always pull up the piping diagram. Okay, and you're going to notice in the service manual that these values are not labeled the exact same way that they are here on the service checker. Okay, so I've gone through and made uh, little diagrams that actually match up, you know, and show what the what the naming is, you know, on the service checker versus just to keep the nomenclature straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah because I mean, they, it might be something you know that's that's similar but kind of different. So it it's easy to get uh, confused. But just keep in mind if you calculate superheat just like you calculate superheat on a conventional system. If you calculate subcooling, just like you calculate subcooling on a conventional unit, you wanna take your subcooling measurement just immediately out of the heat exchanger, right? So just your liquid pipe, that's all it is. Before it gets anywhere else, that's where you take your subcooling measurement. Now, this is cooling mode. Heating mode is gonna be a little bit different. That's, that could be a whole different video in itself. That, that's something totally different. But suction pipe temperature, we're measuring it before it goes into the compressor. Um, one thing that you have to watch for on some of the latest vintages of equipment is the, there's a suction pipe temperature value and then there's also a compressor suction pipe temperature value. Okay, so one thing that you have to keep in mind is where is the oil being injected? Okay, is it injected somewhere between the compressor suction pipe temperature and the field suction pipe temperature value? Because if so, this value is going to be really high. You know, a lot of people automatically assume low charge because they're looking at that compressor suction pipe temperature value. But really all that's there for is to help you determine, you know, adequate oil flow. You know, it's another good way to check oil flow. We talked about oil flow. So if you wanted to confirm that you have adequate oil flow, you need to measure before and after wherever that oil is injected. OK, um, so on this one, the oil separators are directly beyond the compressors. And you notice that the there's a little line coming off the bottom of that separator that goes into the opposing compressor, okay? So if we wanted to judge if this oil separator strainer was plugged, a couple things we could do. Um, one of them would be measure across the strainer. You should have mo no more than three degrees. And then we could also measure before and after where the oil enters into the suction line of the compressor. Notice this little squiggly line right here, that's a capillary tube. So that's to just ensure that we're not just dumping a quarter inch of discharge gas essentially into the compressor, mm -hmm. but we're trickling oil into the suction line. So you should have a, a temperature difference of at least nine degrees before and after the injection of that oil. And so these are all things that, you know, the best thing to do I found with VRV is just take notes and keep them in a central location. You know, if you're not a good note taker, get you a notepad that just says VRV written on the front of it in Sharpie because um, it's easy to get your notes scattered everywhere. But if you can keep them all in a central location, it's a whole lot easier to learn this stuff because it is a lot. It's a lot of values. Thanks, Quentin, for walking us through how to use the service checker as a tool for diagnostics. Uh, hey, hit that like and subscribe. If you guys want something else, let us know, and we'll check you next time on Mechanical Pros.